Hi, I'm Matthew Needham, and this is my air conditioning and refrigeration opposite lecture. There's many things in the air conditioning refrigeration industry that kind of sound like they should be one way, but they're actually the opposite. And so I want to talk about these to clarify um, some of these more complicated thoughts. So first, let's start with electrical loads. Large electrical loads, big compressors, refrigeration, air conditioning compressors, large air conditioning fans, they have small resistances, low ohm readings, um, but it's they're really large electrical loads. They do a lot of work because the low ohms for, let's say, the windings allows a lot of amperage to pass into the motor to actually do the work. So large electrical loads actually have small resistance readings, okay? Next we have small systems have high voltage thermostats. Small systems like window units, domestic refrigerators, small refrigeration um, units have higher voltage thermostats in that they usually have about 115 volt volts going through the thermostat and then that actual voltage that goes through the thermostat goes directly to the air conditioning or refrigeration compressor and those compressors don't pull that many amps three four five amps and those three or four or five amps can actually go through the contact of the thermostat so they typically don't use a transformer and because they're not using a transformer it's more of a direct thing and the compressors don't pull many amps those thermostats can handle the low amps and they're able to actually use a higher voltage thermostat where something like a large air conditioning compressor we have to now use a transformer and a contactor and then the thermostats are low voltage like 24 volts and they barely pass maybe an amp or less and they would energize like a contactor to bring on the compressors indirectly here superheat superheat sounds like oh a lot of heat superheat um, and the origin of that is pretty direct and actually pretty true and that superheat was really about steam, superheated steam, locomotives and mach different machines in the early to mid 1800s. But in air conditioning and refrigeration, in the refrigeration cycle, we're mainly concerned about superheat on the suction line. That's where we're mainly concerned about superheat. And the suction line is actually a cold line. It's cold to the touch when everything's working okay. And it's the opposite of what you'd think, and that's superheat. Because superheat is a number of degrees above saturation or the number of degrees above the boiling point of a substance. So we're very concerned with superheat on the low side to make sure we have some vapor uh, with an insurance policy built in, hence superheat, going into our refrigeration or air conditioning compressors and it's usually cold to the touch in that if the refrigerant is turning into a vapor in the evaporator, let's say at 40 degrees, and we have 50 degrees on the suction line, that 50 degrees is cool or cold, and um, it's superheated vapor with 10 degrees. So once again, we're mainly concerned with superheat on the suction line, and the suction line is typically very cold, may even be below zero on the suction line for certain freezers. Okay. Bubble and dew point, now with the R400 series refrigerants like 410A, 404A, these uh, mixtures of refrigerants, um, sometimes we have to use a pressure temperature chart, known as a PT chart, that would have a dub bubble or dew point bubble or dew point. And it's kind of the opposite of what you think in that in order to get our superheat readings, um, we actually use the dew point on the PT chart. And in order to get our subcooling readings, we actually use the bubble point. If you just kind of remember it's the opposite of what you think, uh, you'll be okay. And that takes us now to subcooling. Subcooling sounds like it should be pretty cold or pretty cool, and we measure subcooling on the liquid line, and this liquid line is generally a little bit warm, a little warmer than the surrounding air, than the ambient. Um, and it sounds like it should be a cold thing, like subcooling, but it's actually a relatively warm reading because we're trying to see how many degrees below the condensing point the refrigerant is, 
and so subcooling is measured on the liquid line and is usually a warm type of reading. Then we have resistances in parallel. Resistances in parallel, um, the more resistances you add in parallel, the total resistance goes down. You think it sounds like adding resistances, the number should go up, but it's actually creating more paths or more lanes like on a highway for the electrons to go down. So it's less crowded. The resistance goes down as you add resistances in parallel. And the total resistance of a parallel circuit is going to be lower than your single lowest resistance. Low airflow. If you have really low airflow, let's say in an air conditioning system because you have a dirty air filter, the and you're running in cooling, let's say, the temperature of the air is going to be lower. It's going to be a lower number. It's going to be colder, which is just the opposite of what you might think. You might think, well, we have a dirty filter. It's not going to come out that cold. It's actually going to come out colder, but the amount of air going uh, out of your registers, we'll say, is going to be a lot less. It's going to be too low, not enough airflow. It's because that air is being slowed down by the air filter and has longer to come in contact with the evaporator coil so it gets colder, but there's barely any air coming out. Likewise, in the heating mode, let's say we're going across a heat exchanger. If you have a dirty air filter or um, if you have, let's say, a dirty air filter, uh, that air is going to be slowed down if you're heating it's going to come in contact with the heat exchanger longer and it's going to come out hotter. Again, you won't have enough airflow and if you really don't have enough airflow, the unit would trip off on the high limit switch. So it's kind of just the opposite of what you'd think. Um, low airflow actually gives you more extreme temperatures. If you're cooling, a colder temperature. If you're heating, a higher temperature, but with insufficient airflow. Okay. Here we have big diameter wires. So big wires like this number two wires or number four wires. Um, they're really big, but they have low uh, American wire gauge numbers on them. And then real tiny wires, uh, like a 16 or a 14, um, they're bigger numbers, but they're actually a smaller diameter of wire. And then also here, we have on a hot day, low superheat. Hot day, low superheat, we're referring to capillary tube systems. You're like, well, wait a minute, it's a hot day, and wouldn't we have higher superheat? No, it's the exact opposite, because with a capillary tube, which is a fixed orifice metering device, the warmer the day is outside compared to the indoor temperature, um, the higher your head pressure, so the greater the flow through that capillary tube, and the greater the flow through the capillary tube and into your evaporator, um, the longer it takes for that liquid refrigerant to turn into a vapor, and so you would have lower superheat. On an air conditioning system that uh, is running on a very hot day, over 100 degrees, you might have a very good superheat of 5 degrees on your suction line, and that's okay. You can find that on manufacturer's charts. That same exact system, if for some reason you had a big internal heat load, like a um, a midnight mass or a rave or whatever, uh, and it was cold outside, but you were still running your air conditioning system, uh, because you'd have a lower head pressure, you'd have less flow to the low side, and that same system also now still working good, just like before, you might have a superheat of 22 or 24 degrees. So it's just the opposite. On a hot day, for capillary tube systems, you're going to have a lower superheat. On cold days, you're going to have a higher superheat. And then here, high efficiency condensers are actually bigger. Usually we think about high efficiency things almost all throughout society, especially in dealing with computers and electronics and communication. Everything always gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But a 20 years ago, 25 years ago, a five ton condensing unit would be about you know this big. Um, now a five ton condensing unit is like this big because you have to have more surface area. The more surface area, the more heat you can get rid of the condenser, the lower your head pressure, the lower your compression ratio, the lower your amps, the more efficient the condensing unit is. So high efficiency condensers for the same tonnage that uh, you have 
they're actually bigger um, than what you know normally you might think oh high efficiency it's gotten smaller no it's actually bigger because you need the surface area when we're talking about heat transfer and that concludes my opposite lecture